and actually I expanded what is on your sheet from what's in the bulletin. The, the original uh, pointed lesson is from verses 3 through uh, 10, uh, but I added 1 and 2 because it, it's a part of this section. It's where the section, the new section begins. Why they left it out of the lectionary, I don't know. So we're going to start with Isaiah 35. Um, only we're going to read verses 1 to 10 as they're printed for you. So let's read them together to get the text in front of us. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer, and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs. In the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. And a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. The unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor any ravenous beast. They will not be found there. But only the redeemed will walk there. And those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them. And sorrow and sign will flee away. Okay. First question, just in line with that uh, picture of the crocus after a long cold winter, what's the first spring flower you will look for? Crocus. Crocus? Well, I can't do the crocus because all my squirrels have dug them up. <laughs> but I used to the little blue flowers. The Scylla? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They come well, up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's I gave, bridges. <laughs> yeah, I gave up on crocuses. I just... And when you see that first flower, how does it make you feel? Hopeful. Good. Hopeful. Oh, right. I like that. Yeah, hopeful. Hopeful. Sure. Even if it snows on top of them again. Mm -hmm. They're hardy. Right? They're hardy and they manage to... <coughs> To live, and that's the picture that uh, God draws through the words of Isaiah. Um, why is that picture necessary? Well, if you go back to chapter 34, so go back to chapter 34. This is uh, uh, chapters entitled "Judgment Against the Nations." Somebody want to read just verses one to four? They're real cheery words. Come here, you nations, and listen. Pay attention, you peoples. Let the earth hear and all that is in it, the world and all that comes out of it. The Lord is angry with all the nations. His wrath is upon all their armies. He will totally destroy them. He will give them over to slaughter. Their slain will be thrown out. Their dead bodies will send up a stench. The mountains will be soaked with their blood. All the stars of the heaven will be dissolved, and the sky rolled up like a scroll. All the starry hosts will fall, all withered leaves from the vine, like shriveled, like withered leaves from the vine, like shriveled figs from the fig tree. That's a beautiful picture. Isn't it? <laughs> now, if you know something about the book of the prophet Isaiah, one of the things that Isaiah does is he, he um, goes through a series of judgments on the nations, and so he'll address one nation after another that has gotten on Israel, and says, your days are numbered, your days are numbered. And then he gets to Israel, and says, your days are numbered. And then he gets to Judah, and says, your days are numbered because of your idolatry. 
But one of the concepts in the Bible is the concept of a remnant. There's always a faithful remnant that God preserves, saves, and, um, and restores. And, and, and that is part of chapter 35. And it, uh, it's a, um, uh, often seen as a messianic uh, passage as well. Um, and I think my favorite image of uh, prophecy came from a book uh, it was written by a Wisconsin Synod guy called Messianic Mountaintops. And, and his point was this, that if you're driving in a car or standing at a distance, it looks like the peaks of the mountains are really close together. And then you get closer and you get to that first one and you realize there's a lot of difference between those peaks that look like they were close together. And this was the, the word picture analogy that he um, used in terms of the Old Testament and the Messianic prophecies, that uh, from a distance it looks like these things are, are kind of close together, but really their fulfillment can be spread out over a longer period of time. And, um, and so this is one of those Messianic prophecies. Uh, uh, now, the fact that after you just read those words of judgment, in this one you have this beautiful picture of restoration, what does that tell you about the ultimate purpose of God's judgment? Why does God judge? Return to me. It's to lead us to repentance. repentance. Mm -hmm. The purpose of the law is to drive us to repentance and... and um, and, and to restore the relationship that he has with us and we have with him. Um, as you're thinking about this passage, one of my favorite, this is one of my favorite ones to use when I go to the hospital if somebody's having a knee replacement. Okay. Oh, I like that. Huh? I like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, my hips. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Ah. Yeah, right? I like that. And, and what it's talking about here now is not somebody who's physically shaking, but as a result of fear. Say to those with fearful hearts. Because when people get scared, they sometimes shake in fear. And, and that's the image here. But, but what he says is, be strong, don't fear your God is going to come. He's going to come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He'll come to save you. Um, and then comes this passage, then will the link with leap like a, a deer. Right? Um, so this is uh, something that's repeated in a number of places in uh, in Isaiah, so let's just look through them. I don't have this on your sheet. Um, but if you go to, <clears throat> excuse me, chapter 29, <clears throat> verse 18. This idea of this transformation that happens when God brings his... Uh, His salvation. So, if somebody want to read just uh, verse eighteen and nineteen. In that day, the deaf will hear the words of the scroll, and out of the gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind will see. Once more, the humble will rejoice in the Lord; the needy will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. A similar kind of thought is. Um, uh, in chapter 32. So if you just go forward a couple of uh, chapters, of verse, chapter 32, uh, verses 1, 2, and 3. Somebody want to read 1, 2, and 3. Is it? Behold, the king will reign in righteousness, and princes will, princes will rule in justice. Each will be like a hiding place from the wind, a covert from the temple, uh, tempest like streams of water in a dry place, like the shade of a great rock in a weary land. Then the eyes of those who see will not be closed, and the ears of those who hear will hearken. 
Okay, so that's chapter uh, 32, and the next one's in chapter 42. So we'd like to go there. Specifically, um, let's go with verses 5 to 7. This is what God the Lord says, he who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and all that comes out of it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand, will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. So one of the signs of the Messianic age is hope is the, the healing that comes from specifically the deaf and the blind. Mm -hmm. um, and remember this is exactly what um, Jesus said when he was asked by John's disciples, are you the one? He says, well, go and tell them what you see. The deaf hear, the blind see, and the and the kingdom is uh, proclaimed. In other words, he goes back to uh, this very image from Isaiah and says, you know, it's kind of uh, that argument: if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it must be a duck. And if this sounds like Messiah, that people's eyes, uh, the blind eyes of the blind are open, the lame leap like a deer. And the deaf hear, the mute speak, um, then you know Messiah is here. And um, this is our connection today to the gospel lesson where Jesus heals a man who is deaf and it says can hardly speak. And I'm sure the hardly speak part is if somebody is deaf, you know, a lot of a large part of how we learn to speak is by what we hear. And very often people who are deaf or, or mostly deaf do not speak real clearly, not because they don't have the equipment to do it, it's just that the way that they would learn to do it is, um, is by watching, hearing um, others. It's uh, uh, one of the reasons why um, Mrs. Cario, who was our reading specialist last year, had right away one of those masks that had plastic on the front, because it's hard to help kids understand how to form words if they can't see your mouth and your teeth and your lips and how those three things are working together in order to effect a certain sound that a child might be struggling with. So um, it's, it's that picture that connects us then with the Messianic uh, age. Uh, and the reality is that there are always things that cause our hands and knees to tremble. Um, and while we may not be the Israelites, we may not be undergoing God, God, God's judgment there, we certainly have reasons that we fear in our day and age, things like pandemics or the political situation in our country right now or you know, the weather um, stuff that has really upended a lot of people's lives. Um, and, and into all of those situations, God is saying, don't fear, I'm with you. And it's always a reminder, God doesn't promise to take us out of the valley. He promises to walk with us through it. So it's, um, um, but it's a word of hope that immediately follows this word of judgment. Now, as you look at this text, um, then you've got this image of uh, the healing that goes on. Um, and, and then he gets onto this image of a highway. And a highway will be built there. And it's given a name. It's called the Way of Holiness. Way of Holiness. And how does this talk about the way inform what Jesus says about himself in John 14, 6. Well, what does John, Jesus say about himself in John 14, verse 6? I am the way, 
way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Or as I like to say it, the way is not a path, it's a person. And the person is Jesus. It's, uh, and, and, and it's that call to a relationship with Jesus is the way to get home uh, to heaven. Only the ransomed and redeemed are found there. Uh, in other words, this idea, no lion will be there, nor any ferocious beast get up on it. Well, how does that draw into? Who are we protected from when we're connected to Jesus? No. Who prowls around like a roaring lion? Uh, or as it says in another place, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. What does he mean by that? If Jesus has taken up residence in your heart and mind, if he's your Lord and Savior, can the devil touch you? No. And the answer is no. Not gonna give up trying, no. Huh? I'm not gonna give up trying. He's not gonna give up trying. No. But as long as Jesus is there, you know, so sometimes uh, this, I've had this question with kids when we were when we read a story about demon possession. And they'll say, Well, can the can the devil possess me? And uh, I'll always say, not as long as Jesus is in you. He can move in to an empty house, but he can't move into a place where Jesus is because Jesus always has power over the devil. That's what the Bible teaches. Um, so it's, it's that uh, protection that uh, is there. And it really sets up the... The language that Jesus uses in John chapter 14. Again, remember when Jesus uses these words, there is no New Testament written. And so what's in the back of their brains is the Old Testament, which is one of the most um, messianic of the, um, which, which of the prophets is most filled with the messianic pro prophecies. It's the book of the prophet Isaiah is sometimes called the gospel of the Old Testament. You know, well, most of our uh, Advent Christmas stuff comes from the beginning of it, right? Mm -hmm. A virgin will conceive and bear a son. Um, out of the stump of Jesse uh, will come one uh, who will rule for me. Um, the people sitting in darkness have seen a great light. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. All of those come from those first few chapters of the book of the prophet Isaiah. And then when you get after this passage in Isaiah 53, uh, it's surely he has borne our sorrows. And we've seen him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But for God has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So there's, there's this uh, really strong... Uh, Emphasis on the Messianic kingdom and the Messianic work. And so when Jesus says, I am the way, their brains would have gone to something like this. Um, and Christianity, when it was first started, was not called Christianity. It was called the way. followers of the way. Um, it's the way. Um, it's so interesting, we just don't ever hear Christianity referred to quite that way right now, but it's this image of being on a path. Um, so when does or will the everlasting joy crown your head? What is he referring to there when he says, they enter Zion with singing, everlasting joy will crown their heads, gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will away you're dying I think most often that's the way we think about it right um, well, that's the only joy that's ever lasting it's the only um, <clears throat> joy that is everlasting but in the book of Hebrews it says you have come to the mountain the Zion of God in other words when you've come to faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior and so, in that sense, when do you and I have joy? When are we crowned with joy, right? Baptism. 
right now. Yeah. When we come to faith. Because joy, remember, is something that comes with faith, and it's something that God imparts with faith, and it stays with us into eternity. Just like our life, uh, death doesn't have any power over us. Jesus says you were already transferred from death to life. When does your everlasting life start? Well, it started the day you believed in Jesus. Which could have been at your baptism before or after. But your everlasting life begins at the point that you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's just it. Um, in the book of Revelation, it says the death has no power over you. When Jesus talks about it with Mary and Martha, he says, or no, in John chapter 5, this is John chapter 5, uh, but the one who lives and believes in me will never die. What does that mean? Well, aren't they going to physically die? Yes. But spiritual death is out of the question. And they're, they're spiritually always alive in, in Christ. Um, and I only know this because I, I did a study on this text once when I preached on it. Um, but I really like this term, um, gladness and joy have overtaken you. Uh, one of the images that comes out of the original language and the way this word is used is somebody who's been overcome by an animal who's faster than they are. And, and, and the picture behind it is just being overwhelmed. And, 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 and so just thinking about this uh, in terms of if everlasting joy starts now, when has that gladness and joy overtaken you? When have you had those moments in your life where you just kind of... You say your heart is full. You say your heart is full. I said that to Jerry a number of times. <laughs> It's just one of those days where your heart is just full, you know? My cup runneth over. My cup runneth over. And God gives us those moments in our lives already, now very often, that we just, uh, just overcome with gladness and joy. It makes me think of uh, C.S. Lewis' book, Surprised by Joy, and how he describes the moments of joy that come. In spite of the, and for those who haven't read the book, it's really about his grief. Yeah, it, it was, I read over that Over having lost his, his, his wife. wife. And, and he, he, wrote, he journaled it, and he, was, he, he wasn't going to publish it. And somebody said, you really need to share that. And it's over a period of, I think, two, three years. Yeah, it, it's a process. Grief is like that, you know, it's, it's a it process. Was, it was very helpful. It really was. And, and he, he puts it all in order, and also the whole idea of being allowed to grieve. You know, so it's a good book. It's a good book. And then the, the last question here is, when has your relationship with Jesus caused sorrow and sighing to flee away? <coughs> Probably at funerals. You, know, you don't have to go to a funeral of someone that you know is a Christian <coughs> and feel bad. You know, it's to go to a funeral of someone that you don't believe have any faith that you're like lost in the sorrow of the fact that they're just gone. You know, they're, they're lost forever. For me it's whenever I'm upset about something but I ask God to write my heart about it mm -hmm. instead of the other person. Instead of the other person to write my heart. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden hours later I'm like, huh. I'm just so troubled anymore. So the sorrow and sighing can be over the everyday kind of relationship kind of stuff. It can be over the the grief we have when we're mourning somebody who has gone home to heaven. I know I always feel that way, and you know I get to sing those hymns probably more than you do. But I I 
I uh, always feel that way when we hit those verses in the uh, in the various songs that are sung at funerals. You know, when Christ shall come with acclamation, what joy shall come with her. Um, and it's usually the last verse. When from the dust of death I rise to claim my mansion in the skies, this then shall be my only free plea. Jesus lived and died for me. You know, it's, it's those kinds of things that I think especially when I'm involved in, in leading a service or being a part of, of one. Um, you know, uh, and it's always been that way, I guess, for a long time. I still have trouble sometimes getting through. I know that my Redeemer lives because we sang that at my grandfather who died of a massive heart, heart attack at 63. We sang it at his funeral. And um, so that especially the verse he lives and wipes away my tears <laughs> or he lives and I shall conquer death. Um, those verses especially are the, they're both happy, sad ones. They remind me of that grief, but they also uh, allow me to look forward to that time when we'll, we'll be re reunited in heaven. So while this was written for the Old Testament people, with whom God had just uh, spoken a pretty harsh word of judgment, as we read, it's a wonderful lesson of God's grace and his peace for his people and his restoration and the ultimate cause of that judgment is to lead us to a relationship with him right um, any other comments or questions about Isaiah 35 about Isaiah 35 I just, I just I don't know I get, I get so depressed even watching the news and all this kind of stuff this, this really does give me joy, and I, I don't know I don't know how people survive in this world right now without having that joy, because it is so depressing out there. And then you hear about all the kids who have committed suicide this year because of COVID and all that kind of stuff. <coughs> They're not taught that they have a future. They're not taught that they have a purpose. And I, that makes me feel even sadder, but then I know that God this kind of thing always gives me hope. And, and that's why these Bible classes to me are so important because it's horrible out there. <laughs> there's, peace, there's, there's peace in my Christian family and that does perpetuate joy regardless of what's out there. Regardless of what's going on out there. To re well, and it's... I always call Sunday morning my attitude adjustment. Well, Bible classes are that way too. It's an attitude adjustment moment. And when I can get depressed and worried about what the world wants to tell me about who's really in control, and then I need to come back and find my place at the foot of the cross and understand how deeply God loves me and at the empty tomb to understand that he's already won the victory. And while it's yet to be played out in human history, um, it's, a, it's an accomplished fact that God will win the day. And, uh, and that allows me to make my journey through life in such a way that I can put up with the, the garbage that happens along the way. It's kind of like, um, I would say it's kind of like having a DVR, you know, and you record like the Badgers are going to play their first game. And, and sometimes I'm not home to, to watch it, so I have to DVR. Well, if I already know they won, <laughs> then when I go back and watch a replay... You don't yell as much. Yeah. Because <laughs> you know something good is going to happen after that. You know the way the game is going to end. And, and that's you know kind of my word picture, my analogy of, of dealing with some of the garbage that goes on in our world is um, thanks be to God he's told us how the story ends and it's a good ending and 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 that's not a pie in the sky hope it's grounded in the death and resurrection of a living human um, 
being who came from heaven to earth to take on the task of our salvation. I, yeah. I think, too, we've talked about people being able to be in touch with those living here that are in heaven. Mm -hmm. And not in touch necessarily, but do they know what's going on? And there are several passages in the Bible that indicate that's a possibility. Whether that happens or not, we don't know. But, uh, for instance, the, um, the rich man and La Lazarus. Lazarus. But at any rate, so someone commented, because I did a lot of reading about that kind of stuff at that time, and somebody said, well, that's horrible that they have to look down on this world for all the sad part, you know. Yeah, but they know the ending. Mm -hmm. So they're not, that, that, that makes a big difference. Right. I mean, they may be able to view what's going on. You can, you can put up with an interception. <laughs> yeah. You know, when the quarterback throws an interception, when you know that somehow you're going to still come out on, on top. Um, yeah, there's that place in, in the book of Revelation. I was just looking to see if I can get there with my concordance where it says the saints before the altar say, how long, O Lord, how long? And it has to do with the persecution that people are undergoing during the time that John is writing in the book of Revelation. And, and, um, and so that's one of those places where very clearly there's... Uh, and the other place that I always go to is Hebrews chapter 12, where it says, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and, and in chapter 11, it's all the saints who have completed the course. They're sitting in the stands, and they're watching us make our journey here. Yep. That, that banner that I made for the anniversary uh, several years ago, that showed Christ and the cloud of witnesses behind it, and the people in the foreground. And that's that's the verse to me. That that's the picture that I tried to portray about that. It took a long time to do all those little people in there. But <laughs> but to me, and, and Sandy helped me with it, she's amazing. Um, but the idea of drawing all those, cutting them all out and everything. And that was well worth it. Because that that banner, when we ever use it, it, it gives me peace because we are. Surrounded. Part of that whole church, yeah. part of surrounded by the surrounded by the cloud of witnesses. I think it is really effective, and it reminds me also of that painting where Christ is coming, and there's he's surrounded by yeah. the believers, and so, what, so it's a it's a good. What 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 well what done. you do when you're looking for how you're going to do a banner? At least I do. You do a lot of research. That might have been something I saw, but to me, the whole idea is to 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 show that our church, you know, those are all of our our uh, people who've passed, and then here we are, and I mean, we can say that about the world too, but that was the whole idea right. that St. John's is. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, I just found the passage in Revelation, it's Revelation 6, verse 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in loud voice, How long, Sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge um, our blood. And each of them was given a white robe. So that tells you they're aware that, uh, first of all, they're aware it's not soul sleep as they're waiting for the consummation of, of heaven. And, uh, uh, and it talks about the, the witness, how long. So, well, let's uh, move on to James chapter 2. And uh, if you'll go there in your Bibles, and then um, we'll uh, start by... Keep jumping over to my Bible. It's not that big of a one. <laughs> James chapter 2 um, so um, why don't we start reading it I'm going to step out and step back in again so let's uh, yeah let's read it together my brothers and sisters believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, 
but say to the poor man, You stand there, or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. It is not the rich who are exploiting you. Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law from all the scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and it stumbles at just one point, it is guilty of breaking it all. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, Go in peace, Keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs. What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself is not accompanied by actions, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. Okay, this is, uh, uh, it's a, always interesting to me what they cut and leave out, and I know they can't leave everything in, or we be in church forever. Okay. We read the whole, whole book, but, um, um, but let's start here. Where and when have you seen discrimination against certain kinds of people? When have you personally experienced that or or no people who were discriminated oh, against. Oh, dear. <laughs> Where and when? Anybody got any examples? Oh, I have kind of a weird one. A um, couple of years ago, I was working on the remodel at Brown Deer middle school and the woman that's the facility manager there we were in a meeting together and we were the only two women in the meeting it was a construction meeting and she left the meeting with a totally different take on the meeting than I did she felt like throughout the meeting the con that all the men contractors in the meeting had been totally disrespecting her and she's like don't you just hate it when they do that and isn't it just awful and I was just sitting there looking at her going that has never been my experience, and I didn't feel like they were doing that to you at all. Is this more your problem or their problem? You know, I, right, was like, right. I wasn't entirely seeing how they were discriminating. They weren't agreeing with her necessarily, and she was asking for things and answers on things that they didn't have answers to, but I was just like, I don't, I don't know that you were being discriminated against, but, <laughs> You know, maybe you were, but I certainly didn't see it. Is it a perception or is it a... Is it a reality? Reality. Yeah. Don't you think that's true most of the time? Exactly. I mean, and she was, she's considerably younger than me, so, and I, you know, and she always, you know, so my perspective on those kinds of things is I think is different because of the era I grew up in. Sure. And, you know, I just expected certain treatment, which I never felt was being mean to me, you know, or disrespecting me. Yeah. So, anyway. She obviously she had, a bigger, she had bigger thoughts about herself than everybody else did, obviously. Well, so, <laughs> or such bad thoughts about herself that right. she interpreted everything that way. Exactly. Insecure in her position. Yeah, very often uh, when people react a certain way, it's about a previous experience. Right. Or, um, 
you know, and it could be that if somebody had disrespected her significantly in the past and somebody in that meeting used some of the same kind of language that was used by that person, that would have triggered, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because you just have to be careful because people interpret things out of their own context. Right. And, I know I ran into uh, all the time when uh, uh, Don Corte wrote me into being on the <laughs> internal review board at Concordia. You know, and I was constantly, uh, uh, professors and students, would, professors as well, would come in with surveys, and um, and on the survey would be a question, and uh, very often it was something that might re refer to a, either depression or a physical abuse or a sexual abuse kind of thing, and, and there was no caveat, uh, which was required if you're gonna ask those kind of questions, you have to uh, include a reference to the counseling center if something here is, is upsetting to you. Uh, because again, you just don't know what you're going to trigger um, just by asking a question. And you might think it's innocent, it's just a way of collecting. We're just collecting information, you know, what's the big deal? But if it triggers something in somebody who's been mistreated in some way in the past, um, it, it, it can become a real, real um, uh, instigator to, to some kind of uh, uh, spiral of depression that could lead to other things. So sometimes you, you, it's, it's just hard because you don't know what that other person, right. those other people have been through right. and uh, what might be those triggers. Um, you know, I, uh, I guess seen it in, in uh, a couple of ways. One is our good friend from Ghana adopted a girl in Uganda. He couldn't tell his family because she would have, the family would have been prejudiced against her. You know, uh, treating people uh, differently. I think it's a big problem in blended families where you have children from previous marriages and how do you not have a special feeling or relationship for your own biological child um, that the other person doesn't have because they haven't grown up in the same way with that child? It's why step families are so often some of the hardest families to put together because of that, that different affinity. And it's not necessarily intentional. It's not an intentional thing. It's just it's a part of sometimes how we uh, we just react in those kinds. Of situations, um, so um, just thinking about people uh, being treated as favorites, or um, most of us probably in various classes with various teachers could have identified who is the well, teacher's pet. Teacher's pet, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Who got it seemed special treatment it seems, from but that Sometimes team. it isn't. Sometimes it's just they actually are producing. They're actually doing something. Right. But it the makes other the teacher's job easier. Well, yeah, but see, the other people around it don't, don't see get that, that mm -hmm. and then they think no. that person is your pet. But I had that in high school. I had a kid who did just about, when I was teaching high school, did all kinds of stuff for me because she thought she, that, and I couldn't give her higher than a B. And one time she said, Well, how come you don't give me an A? And I says, I've been lying to you. He says, You're going to go to school and think you're a great artist and stuff, and they're just going to crush you. Yeah, yeah. And I said, I can't, you know, but she tried to be a teacher's pet. Right. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. But I, I like this concept, though, but then I think a lot of people are concerned about giving to some people who appear to be poor because they're not poor. Right. They do it as a lifestyle. Um, so I like the fact that there are places like the rescue mission that you can give things to that will meet those people's needs right. and you know it's really going to go to those people mm -hmm. because it's really tough to um, sometimes to determine although I think it's very important that we don't dismiss people who need are in need but we had a, a couple that once Den and I knew that just said how hard it was to have food and all this kind of stuff so we went shopping and we brought two bags of food over to our house they were going to have steaks that night. Yeah. She says, oh, I, I don't need this. 
I said, well, then how come you told us you were so poor? You know? Yeah. And Very. So. Yeah, you, you, because unfortunately that's, so how do you draw the line, the balance between making an accurate judgment about somebody's real need and not missing an opportunity to serve them? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about that one family a long time ago, first congregation, this station wagon pulls into the parking lot, they knock on the parsonage door, which is right across, and say, uh, the guy says, my wife is diabetic and she needs some food. Can you give us some money so we can do that? Well, we just happen to have a number of kinds of canned foods in the soups and all that kind of thing over in the fellowship hall, which was right across the driveway from where we lived. And I said, um, well, I said, we don't really have a fund for that. But what we do have is we've got some food over here. So we can get you some, you know, bread and, and uh meat we could provide and and there's uh, cans of soup over here if you want to just pull in come in uh, i'll get you the pots and pans you can make some food and that way she'll get something to eat and well no thank you right. and you say well you know yeah how much do you really need i think um you know a lot of people what are some of the other places? Now he's talking specifically about, suppose a man comes into your meeting, that's into church. Wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in filthy old clothes comes in. There was a, there, there was a story about a pastor who was gonna be new and people hadn't really met him yet. <laughs> and in order to, and this this church was going to have the service, and this ragey old man comes in, and they kind of push him aside, and they push him aside, but they can't figure out where the pastor is, and when is he going to come, and all of a sudden this ragey old man comes up, and he marches right up to the altar, and he says, I'm your new pastor. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to see how you guys would treat somebody. Treat somebody who's Yeah. Coming. <laughs> um, well, isn't it the old saying, you can't tell a book by its cover? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's, um, it's, it's one of the challenges is um, to get to know somebody's heart and not judge just on the appearance of what you see. But I think the important thing is you're doing it, it's your deed. And you are showing your faith by doing that. Whether that person needs it or not, you are still addressing what you perceive. See, yeah. And maybe it'll embarrass the person so that they actually realize that they need to change their ways. However, I think it's important to say we are still showing our faith with the deeds. And I don't think just because somebody else doesn't need it necessarily or we we guessed wrong, I don't think that negates what our actions are. What your intent is. What your intent, what your intent is. is. But it can color you for the next time someone comes forward. Oh yeah. And it, and yeah. it gets harder and harder to be charitable when you get taken advantage of. When you of. get taken advantage of. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that is the hard part is when you realize that you've been Burned yep. by somebody, and um, and and I think uh, you know my best advice to people because I was uh, before I came here the first time I was in North Fond du Lac and there I was a AODA tw uh, fifth step listener, which meant you went to the hospital when they did a lot of in treatment uh, or inpatient uh, alcohol and other drug abuse, and fifth step is when you got to confess to a person. Fourth step is you take a fearless moral inventory of your behavior. Fifth step is to confess it to somebody. And so they used a few of us um, in the community who would be willing to come in and, um, and uh, have them have that time of confession. And then uh, after that, they're supposed to go start making restitution to those who they have severely hurt. And, um, and it's just interesting listening to the stories of people and um, how they were kind of self-medicating very often over a different, but also what lengths they would go 
to get money for a drink. And it's, it's what changed my attitude toward handing out cash to anybody. Mm -hmm. I'll buy you a meal. Um, I'm more than glad to do that. God, this um, is embarrassing. Some people keep, um, <laughs> some people keep, uh, 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 you know, they'll, they'll make uh, handout packs for people who are homeless. And, uh, and, and so they have something ready, like uh, uh, some, some uh, cereal bars and bottles of bottled water and that kind of thing in a bag, and you say, "Well, I won't. I'm not going to give you money, but you're welcome to this a pair of warm socks. Um, things that uh, that you can do to help somebody uh, in that situation." So I'm I'm very leery of giving out um, cash to people just because I know. Had too much experience with people who, who would abuse it. What's the relationship between faith and deeds in this passage? This is a passage that causes, uh, for some people, a lot of challenges. It was uh, this passage that led Luther to wonder whether it should even be in the Bible. Yeah. It kind of negates the guy who says, I can worship God on a hill and I'm just fine without being part of a congregation because you can't live in isolation. And I think the whole idea is deeds, it, deeds are, have to be done within a community. Right. And that whole idea that I don't need a community, I can just be here by myself and communicate with God and nature and all that. Me and God got a good thing going, I don't need anybody else. Well, yeah. not if you worship the God of the Bible because <laughs> There's at least 35 one another's in the Bible, and you can't do it unless you're in community with somebody. Yeah, Katie. Um, I look at it that the deeds are a result of your faith, that the, not the cause of your faith. You know, so you, you know, people might look at us and say, well, you're just doing good deeds because you want to be in good with God. And it's like, no, we're in good with God, which is why we choose to do good deeds. And you have to be very careful not to flip the story. Flip the story. And I think Jesus gets at this really well when it comes to the image of a tree. He says a good tree produces good fruit. But that fruit bearing might actually take a while, so be careful, don't judge. And that's why he's got that one parable where he says, you know, well, Garden. let's dig around it, fertilize it for another year. Then if it doesn't bear fruit, we'll cut it down. Because the tree might look dead when it's when it's not, or not bear fruit when it should. But what comes first, a healthy tree or a healthy or the fruit? Well, you can't have fruit unless there's already a tree. tree. And and so we think about uh, faith as being like the tree, and um, and the works being like the fruit. Then it makes sense when you say those are too big. Now. This is where, um, where there was a strong difference uh, in uh, actually Roman and Catholic theology. Um, and, it, it, and it was, what is it that makes somebody, is it faith that saves? Or is it faith and works that saves? Well, on the one hand, we say just faith, but on the other hand, um, we say works are also present. So uh, this is one way the reformers got at it. They said, um, are works necessary in a Christian's life? And the answer is yes. yes. What they, what they disagreed with was that people would add these two words for salvation. So the works are necessary. Wherever there is faith, there's also going to be works. There's also going to be fruit. And that fruit is going to be a varying size and quantity and quality. Right? And one of the problems is that is that you and I have a tendency to judge what other people's fruit are 
rather than looking at our at our own. But and how do you know that? The other way to get at this and the difference between I've got the two references in Paul where he says faith, you know, we're saved by faith alone, not by works of the law. And how do you reconcile that? Well, you also reconcile it, and, and that's one of the challenges with this text, is you reconcile it by the context. So let's um, keep reading. If you've got uh, James chapter 2 open. Oops. So, um, so at the end here, um, what's interesting is that it stops at verse 18. But verse 19 is, I think, really crucial to understanding how James is using the word faith. So, somebody read uh, verse 19 for us. You believe that there is one God, good, even the demons believe that and shudder. So what is he saying here faith is? You believe. And, and so what we would say is looking at this, that Paul and James are using the word faith in two different ways. Um, one way to get at this is to let the scholastic theologians help us. Uh, because when they defined faith, they said there are three essential elements to faith. There's knowledge, there's assent, and there's trust. And, and what he's saying here is when James is using the word faith, it's everything above the line. He's not including trust. How do we know that? Because of this passage. He said, you believe, right? And then he says, oh, that's good. You believe that there's one God good, even the demons believe that and shudder. So here's where you get that, right? What's the knowledge? There's one God. What's the knowledge? Jesus Christ is Lord. Fill in any of the... Uh, doctrines that the Bible teaches. But just take Jesus Christ as Lord. Um, that's a statement. It's a propositional statement. It's either true or false. Now I can believe it to be true in James' sense by saying, yes, I know it's true. That's a sent. That's saying I know that that is a true statement. But a demon recognizes who Jesus is, says, yes, it's true, but they shudder. Where do we see examples of that in the Bible? Jesus walks by somebody who's demon-possessed. He puts him in those pigs. He puts him in those pigs, right? And says, and, and they say, you're the Holy One of God, get away from us. They know exactly who Jesus is, so they have the knowledge, and they assent, it is true, and they shudder. They say, get out of here, Jesus, because nothing good's going to happen with you here. But when Paul uses the word faith, he includes the concept of trust or reliance. Um, when he says, it is by faith you are saved, he's definitely not talking about the faith of demons like James is. And, and again, the way you get at that is just by context. You know, when Paul talks about faith, it's always in the context of trusting Jesus, relying on Jesus for your salvation. It's, it's not you just know that Jesus existed and that, yes, he died, and yes, he claimed to be Lord, and yes, he is Lord. He's just not your Lord. And, and that's one of the ways when I'm, I'm, I, I use this with... Uh, <laughs> When I'm teaching about the resurrection, and I have a, I use C.S. Lewis as is Jesus liar, Lord, or lunatic, or should be liar, lunatic, or Lord, right? A liar is somebody who says, I'm Lord. Jesus went around saying, I'm Lord, I'm Savior. And if it's false, then he's a liar. And what's worse is he's a fool because he died for it, and so did all his disciples. It doesn't make sense that they would all, to a man, have suffered for their faith for a lie 
The second possibility, he runs around saying, I'm Lord. He really believes it, but it's not true. Well, then he's crazy. He's a lunatic. I feel like me sticking my hand in my shirt saying, I'm Napoleon. Because <laughs> I'm short like he was. <laughs> and you'd say, Pastor, you need serious help. <laughs> you know? Um, so that's another possibility. But the problem with calling Jesus a lunatic is lunatics are usually... <coughs> Uh, to use that language, they're always crazy. You don't have people saying about somebody who's a lunatic that uh, uh, they have some of the most profound teachings, right? Um, it's teaching in parables, uh, Sermon on the Mount, all of that kind of stuff, okay? So at least one, one truth is that Jesus is Lord, he says he is, and he really is, but that doesn't necessarily mean so. <coughs> the question is: Is there are two groups of people here? To use James' language, there's those who are to, who say Jesus is Lord, including the demons, and to use Paul's language, he says Jesus is my Lord. Big difference, that little word, my. Because the word of trust, reliance, dependence. Um, the demons can say Jesus is Lord, and that's the way James is using the word faith here. And uh, again, context is always determinative. And that's how we reconcile that passage with Romans 3 and Galatians 2. And I think Jesus' analogy of the tree and the fruit at the end of the Sermon on the Mount makes a whole lot of sense in putting it together. Wherever faith is present, there's also going to be a good work. And I, I, I'm just finishing a book um, where they use the thief on the cross and they say, well, he didn't have any good works. Well, yes, he did. What did he do? He witnessed. He witnessed. He defended Jesus. As he was going through that faith process, he confessed Jesus, and he confessed Jesus was a king by his uh, question, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. You know, now, might not have been, he, so some people say, well, gee, what kind of good works did he do? Well, he had those. But it, it isn't the good works that saved him. It's just a fruit of faith. When he got to that point where he trusted Jesus, and he asked in that prayer for that blessing, all of a sudden, Jesus who's Lord is Jesus is my Lord. And wherever faith is present, the fruits are going to grow. Um, but they're going to grow in us differently. So what do I mean by that? Um, if I had you raise your hand and say, who in here is a worrier? <laughs> and who's the take a chill pill, everything's going to be okay. <laughs> right? Don't care anymore. <laughs> now we are wired differently and so when we come to a text where Jesus says don't worry, don't take any thought for tomorrow and all of that kind of stuff, those of us who are worriers struggle with that more than those of us who are take a chill pill, everything's going to be okay. God's got this. What are you worried about? You know? But if you're not wired that way, so that's one of the challenges when you compare your spiritual growth with somebody else's, is that they may start at a different place than you do, and you just have to realize that, that they're there. I remember uh, C.S. Lewis has this in one of his books about somebody who says, you know, about Christians and spiritual growth, and says, well, I know a lady who comes to church, and she's the grumpiest, you know, and Lewis's response is, you should have seen her before she met Jesus. <laughs> right? <laughs> In other words, she's grown, but to you it may not look like she's grown. Um, because she may be started in a different place than you did. And, and that's the challenge when we're judging other people and their fruit in their lives. Um, Okay, let's, uh, what do we got here? About 10 minutes. Who are the rich in our community and who are the poor in our community? And I want you to look a little bit more carefully at this, uh, 
at this uh, text as he defines it. Who are the rich and who are the poor? Wow, it comes back again how you look at people or how you feel about yourself, I think. Well, is it money? I mean, it seems like it's a class, class dependent on wealth. That's where we would go. Um, normally as we're reading this text, especially because of the example he uses, somebody wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in, so it has to do with the outer look, what they could afford. But but look at verse 5. So he's, he's using these words in different ways. In verse 5 he says, who are the poor? Sometimes it's the poor who are the richest in faith. So this became real to me when I did some work in the area of things like stewardship. And if you look at the percentage of income that poor people give over against rich people, mm -hmm. oh, okay. they tend to give far more, sometimes double, in a percentage way than, uh, than, a, than a rich person does. There was a pastor I once talked to or whatever, or I, I heard this. The, he gave an example of a, a poor guy who had prayed, Lord, you know, please help me in my future endeavors that I might be, you know, successful and all that. And he gave 10% of his income. Now he became wealthy. And he came and talked to the pastor. He says, well, I got a problem because... It's really hard for me to give 10% of what I have. Could you help me pray about it? And the pastor said and prayed, Dear Lord, make this gentleman poor again so he'd be more <laughs> likely to give 10%. <laughs> to make it easier to give 10%. Make it easier to give. <laughs> well, and, and you know, when you when you think and contrast that, this is kind of the example I always used is um, if... If you have somebody who is, uh, let's say, making uh, around uh, 25000 a year, right? And they're giving 10%, they're giving 2500 And then you got somebody who's making 250000 a year. Well, that means they'd be giving 25000 Okay? And, 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 and you say, well, they're both tithing. Well, yes, they are. But another way to look at that is how much of this 25000 does that person need to live to put food on the table, a roof over their head, the basic necessities of life? How much of this does that person actually need to live to put a roof over their head? And, and yet, <laughs> and yet, this person's, and, 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 and that's, the, that's the point that Paul makes in 2 Corinthians 9, out of their poverty, they gave far more than we could have asked or imagined. Because this 25000 to a person making 250000 is a drop in the bucket. They don't need any of that money to live, whereas this becomes more of a sacrifice. This, you really don't have to give up much. Now, yeah, you'd have to give up something. You'd have to say, yeah, what could I buy with that 25000 If I gave only 2500 that would leave twenty two fifty. I could buy a new boat, right? Part of, part of that. Part of that. <laughs> you know, I could go on a really, really, really nice vacation or a couple of smaller vacations mm -hmm. with that money, you know? And it's just, again, putting into context what it means to be rich and poor. And, of course, this is picking up um, uh, and, and would be reflected in Paul's language when he says, he who was rich became poor so that we who were poor might become rich in, in him. And it's this kind of grand reversal that James is also uh, playing with here. Uh, 
to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him. Um, so it's, it's, it's not the, are not the rich exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? So they obviously would have um, people. Now remember, uh, James, in this context, he is the bishop in the city of Jerusalem. So who are these rich people? The Jews. They're the Jewish leaders. Um, who would be a part of who he's referring to, the ones who would drag them into court and, and slander the noble name slander the name of Jesus. Remember, James got killed. Um, James got killed. He was uh, uh, martyred for his faith. He was martyred for his faith. Um, and he was not originally a believer in Jesus. Remember, he was one of the ones outside who, you know, his mother and brothers thought he was a little crazy. But he eventually becomes a believer and, and uh, becomes the bishop of Jerusalem. So, so this, this James, we say by legend, was a brother of Christ. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, it's, there's a little bit more to it than just legend. Um, in terms of who he is, He's, he identifies himself with James. He was probably the brother of Jesus, the leader of the Jerusalem Council. And you see that uh, played out in Acts chapter 15 when he's the one who settles the matter. You know, Paul and Peter are there, but who's the one who settles the matter? It's James. Um, so that is uh, uh, the most likely candidate for this particular letter. And. Um, yeah, just what's one practical way you can love your neighbor this week? The whole law, he says, is summed up in this one command. Oh, and I, I did want to end on this too. That's right. That, um, it's interesting why they took, in my mind, so you'll be, you'll be thinking about it as we uh, read it on Sunday, but they took out chapter or verses 11 to 13. For he who said, don't commit adultery, he also said, don't commit murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Yeah. It's interesting that that's what was eliminated, because um, what he's speaking about is, is again, good deeds. And one of the greatest deeds is to share the mercy that we first re received from God. The getting what we don't deserve, you see, is what mercy is. I mean, not getting what we do deserve is mercy. Not getting what we do deserve is mercy. And, um, and, and so God calls us to be Christ-like in the way that we share mercy in our lives. Well, let's pray about that this week. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for the opportunity once again to be reminded of the evidence of the Messianic Kingdom and the Messiah you sent into this world and your son Jesus that uh, because of his love and grace and the uh, breaking in of the kingdom power, uh, blind could see, lame could leap, deaf could hear, and mute could could speak. He cast out demons. He proclaimed the kingdom, and especially this kingdom that uh, lets us know that um, the ultimate purpose of any judgment we experience from your hand is to lead us to repentance and into a deeper faith into the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. And we just ask, Lord, that you would allow us to share um, in the love of that way in such a way that um, uh, gladness can continue to overcome us and that sorrow and sighing can flee away as we live in the power and promise of the joy with which we've been crowned. And now we ask uh, also that you'd allow us to bear the fruits of 
of a genuine faith that is trust in you, um, in the works, uh, the good deeds, the love, the care that we give to uh, our uh, family, our, our family of faith uh, in and through our community and in our world. Bless us, Lord, as we continue to reflect your mercy uh, into this world in the same way that we received it because of the life, death, and resurrection of your Son. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. See you next week. Or we'll see you Sunday. Sunday. <laughs> no Monday service, remember.